Um, let's look specifically about Android application itself. What exactly is an Android application? When you develop an Android application, what exactly are you doing? How do you structure an Android application? What are the pieces of an Android application itself? Now, here you will start noticing that writing Android applications is not the same as writing applications in standard PCs and other platforms that you have done before. Your way of thinking has to be slightly different, has to change a little bit because the way you structure the Android application also determines how your application will be designed. As I mentioned, all Android applications are done in Java. The compiled Java code along with data and resource files which you will see in some in the examples that you will see later are all bundled together into one single package called as an APK package. Okay? What is an APK package? It contains all the classes, Java file classes, the data files, the resources, and all the things that you make use of within your application, packaged into one single bundled file. The APK format is similar to zip format. If you are familiar with zip, if you, you know how to make use of zip, right? If you have a bunch of files together, you, you know how to put it into a zip file, right? Same kind of thing. You can open an APK file using using any zip um, uh, tool, like um, like uh, Seven Zip or something like that. You can open it and see what is inside there. It's interesting experience when you see the APK file that you develop for your application. Open it up with a uh, with one of the zip tools and see what is inside. You will see the Java classes. You will also see the resource files that you created, the XML resource files that you created when you uh, design your application. They will all be in there, inside the uh, APK file. Now, Android calls it uh, the .apk, and you will see the extension .apk for all uh, Android executable files. This is the file that you will take and install on your device. Okay. So when you connect your mobile phone with a USB cable to your, uh, your development platform, and then hit the run button to to export the application to the device, this APK file is transferred to the device and then installed on your device. So that's what is done in practice. Now, as I mentioned in one of the previous slides, every Android application runs as a separate process. So it lives in its own world. It doesn't deal with the other applications that are also running uh, simultaneously on the same platform. So as you realize, Linux underneath is a multiprocess supporting platform. You can have multiple processes simultaneously active in the, in the, in the kernel, uh, supported by the Linux kernel. You all know how, what multiprocessing, uh, multiprogramming and so on is from your operating systems course. So that kind of thing is supported here. Now, when you start up multiple applications in Android, all of them are, each application that your startup will be running in its own process. Process is the same as the underlying Linux process that we have here. Now, when does the process get started? The process corresponding to an application gets started when any one of the components that form part of the application is invoked. This is where you will see slight difference from how applications run in the standard um, environment as opposed to in Android. And furthermore, each process has its own virtual machine. So the Dalvik virtual machine together with the process forms one unit. And it is completely what we call a sandboxed. So two processes cannot interfere with each other. So that is how you provide separation between the two, between the different processes. And every application, as you realize, if it is a process in Linux, Every process in Linux is assigned a process ID, and that is also done even in Android because it's nothing but a Linux process. Okay. Now, what are the components of an Android application? 
how do we define components in an Android application? How do we design components in an Android application? Now, uh, as we will see, an Android application is composed of multiple components. Now, I am not defining what a component is yet. I will come to that in a short while. Okay? An application is made up of, can make use of elements of other applications. So this is how Android applications work. If you have something that I can make use of, I will be able to call your part of the application that, that is supported by a component and will make use of it for my purpose. How is that done in practice? I will explain that in one of the later um, uh, sections. But applications themselves are composed of parts or components that can be started up whenever the need arises. Okay, As we will see with examples in the lab and so on, Android applications do not have a single entry point. When you write Android applications, you will not see a main function anywhere. When you write C, when you write Java, you always have a main function defined somewhere, right? Without a main, there is no code written. That's the first thing that you need to write, and that is from where you control the execution of your application. This is what you are used to in writing C, C++, or Java applications. When you write an Android application, you won't see a main function anywhere. So, obviously, you will ask me, where is the main function? There is no main function. The main function functionality is inside Android's framework. And that takes care of invoking components within your application. This way of thinking is different from the way you structure code in your standard application development as opposed to Android. Don't think anymore in terms of one single thing, starting up things and then coming back. There is no coming back. There are bits and pieces that do different parts and you compose them together as and when you require in order to provide certain functionality. And this requires a little bit of different way of thinking. Okay? So let me tell you very clearly, don't look around to replicate the way of thinking that you were doing for standard application development that you have been doing so far. Rethink the way you design applications when you do Android applications. In iOS, you still see that main function there. But in Android, you don't see it anymore. Okay? Unless you break out of that way of thinking, you will have difficulty, or rather, you will not be able to take the full advantage of Android functionality, Android application functionality that is provided for you. Okay? That's why I specifically put that point in there, saying no main function. Okay? And components. How do you design components within an Android application? As we will see with examples, in Android itself, there are four basic components. We will talk about activities. What are activities? Activities are components that are somehow related to dealing with users, dealing with the outside world. They are the ones that seek interaction with the outside world. So whenever you need to interact with somebody, that is whenever you need to present a screen to the user, that screen has to be supported in the back by a, an activity. That's the first thing that you need to think, keep in mind. So as you see in your application, moving from one screen to another screen to another screen and so on, that is when you touch different parts of the screen, you move to a different screen and so on. So for example, in mail, when you touch one part of the mail, the mail opens up and then you go back to the list earlier and then you will go back and then go forward and so on. Every screen in the back is supported by an activity. That's the first way of thinking that you need to if you need to do things in the background, those are supported by something called services. What is the job of a service? A job of a service, again, 
I am sort of generalizing it. I will explain specific details about each one of them as we go along. Services in general are designed for doing things in the background. Examples. Suppose you need to download a file. You should not be downloading the file right within the screen, uh, the, the activity that is controlling the screen that is being presented to the user. Instead, if you need to do any large scale downloading, shift it to the background and let it do its work in the background. And services are the primary components that support doing work in the background. Similarly, for example, if you start playing a music file, you should not be playing the music file directly using the activity that is controlling the screen. Even if the user navigates away from the buttons for the music player, music still should still continue playing in the background. That is supported by a service. There is a service component that is running in the background that takes care of running the, that takes care of, of playing out the music file in the background and so on. That's the second part. Again, notice how you need to rethink the way you design bits and pieces of your application. Okay? So typically, an activity deals with something presenting some screen to the user. The user touches a few buttons. You need to do some work in the background. Push it off to a service to do in the background. Okay? Now, when you push off something in the background, when that finishes, the background work finishes, it needs to notify back to you saying, I am done, I'm done with my work. And whatever you needed is ready. That notification back, those kind of things are supported by broadcast receivers. So what is the job of a broadcast receiver? A broadcast receiver helps you to identify events that happen somewhere. And then that's a way of notifying the user saying, look, what you needed is done. Respond. And typically, that is what you see being used for the notification bars. If you have used an Android device, you notice that when you're installing an application or when, when um, uh, a, an email arrives and things like that, tiny little notifications pop up on the screen. And when you pull it down, you see a notification there. The notification manager makes use of the broadcast receiver for that purpose. Okay. The fourth one, called as a content provider. The job of the content provider, as you notice from the name itself, content provider. So it is storing some data somewhere and then making it available to you. Examples, contact lists. Where do you keep contact lists? Contact lists are usually stored in a backend database. And you can expose the backend database to users through a content provider. What is the job of the content provider? The job of the content provider is to manage interaction with the database in the background and provide you with a nice, clean API for you to, to interact with the background. So that's the job of the content provider. Again, so within your application, you might have different functionalities that need to be done. And you need to divide those functionalities into pieces based upon the kind of work each one of them is doing and then allocate them to activities, services, broadcast receivers, and content providers. A particular application that you design may not have all the four components. Okay? A initial naive Android user generally tends to stick around only with activities. People are scared of using services because until you experience doing it, you don't want to send something away into the background because you never know how to come back from there. Okay? That is something that you need to get used to. You should be willing to trust and give away something to the background to a service to finish with the full confidence that when that is done, it is going to come back and tell you that it is done. And designing that interaction is very, very important. You can say, I'm going to hold my activity and I'm going to hold the screen and wait until all my download is done. But that is a bad user experience. A frozen screen is a very bad way of delivering user experience. 
human beings inherently are very, very, what do you call that? Impatient. How many times have you touched the screen like this? On the screen. And when nothing happens, what do you do? You keep touching even more things. The more you touch, the more back-end events you are generating for your application. And the more you are going to delay your application. Case in point. When you stand near an elevator, next time when you go stand near an elevator, observe those, uh, you know, type A personalities. They are pushing the, pushing the buttons continuously. Why? They think that if they push the button 100 times, the elevator is going to come down immediately. It's not going to happen, my friends. The elevator has a mind of its own. Right? That's the point. I'm just kidding. But it is important to realize that when you hand over, when things need to be done in their own time, let it be done in its own time and then let it notify you back after it is done. So that's where these components help you to branch off. And you can still provide a nice user experience to the user and not freeze the screen. In fact, in Android, if you freeze the screen for more than five seconds, the application uh, Android complains to you, as we will see. I will even show you examples of how you can end up doing the wrong thing. Okay? So, within Android, you would look at an Android application as consisting of four parts. Any iOS developers will notice that there is no such counterpart in iOS. Okay, iOS has a different way of looking at things, completely different way of looking at things. So to an iOS developer, this looks strange. But uh, you know, you, if you need to develop an Android application, you need to think like an Android application. You should not think like an iOS application. You should not think like a standard application that you develop for a desktop or the standard computer. You need to think like an Android application. Okay, that's one thing that I need to remind you about. Otherwise, you won't be taking advantage of the features provided by the platform itself. So, four parts. Okay? As we will see, an activity is, sorry, an activity is typically dealing with the visual user interface for the user that needs to interact. Well, this is actually a screenshot from uh, an example from last year. You will see an updated version of this screenshot tomorrow in the in the lab when you go. This will become 4521 four, and so on. You will see how you create a, a, a screen like that and how it is supported by an activity in the background uh, tomorrow. Okay. What does an activity allow? It provides for user interaction. When the user touches the screen, you should be able to realize that the user touched the screen. At what point did the user touch the screen? Did the user simply touch the screen and then remove that finger? Or did the user touch the screen and hold the finger for a long period of time? Did the user flick the finger this way, this way, this way, this way? Or did this, this, all sorts of features? have to be supported by the underlying thing. So whatever you do on the screen has to be supported in the back by an activity. So anything that interaction that you do on the screen, you need to do something in the back to support that. You will see that being supported by using methods in the background, as we will see with examples later. Okay? First and foremost, the activity's primary job is to create the user interface and paint it on the screen. And once the in interface is presented, then deal with user's interaction with the screen. For example, when the user, uh, you may display the screen for a few seconds and then immediately switch to this screen, and so on, as we will see in the example later. So that's what an activity is doing. Okay. And typically, an application consists of one or more activities. Don't try to do everything in a single activity. Partition the work into a group of activities that will one, one activity triggering the next one, triggering the next one, and so on. There is always a way to come back. Don't worry about it. 
Okay. So every activity has a default window to draw on the UI. So every activity controls the screen. And when one activity triggers the uh, second activity, the first one disappears into the background. The second one comes up and occupies the screen. And then when the second one triggers the third activity, the third one will come and control the screen. The second one will disappear in the background. There is a way of doing it in practice. In any Android application, usually one activity is marked as what is called as the main activity. When you touch the application icon, when you touch the button, the main activity is the first one that gets started. All subsequent interactions will be dealt with, but all other activities that are invoked thereafter. So moving from one activity to another is accomplished by having the current activity start the next one. So that is how you move from one screen to another screen. So when you move from one screen to the next screen, in the background, one activity is triggering another activity. And that's how you move to the next screen. And so on. So that's one more thing that you need to keep in mind. And you can also return to the previous activity if you need. Android has this back button, which allows you to go back to the previous screen. And that has to be supported also within your application. So that's one way of interacting with your application. Okay? So keep in mind, when you design applications, that is something that you need to keep in mind. Okay? These details of the activities that are part of an application is, is declared in a file called as the manifest file. You will see the manifest file tomorrow in the lab in one of the first examples that you will see tomorrow. Um, today I am not showing you the, uh, the code directly here, but in some of the later classes I will even actually show you the code, show you exactly where the parts are, and then show you the Excel, uh, uh, sorry, not Excel, the Eclipse running on the screen and including uh, showing you how things uh, happen on the screen and so on. Today, I don't have much to demonstrate, so I won't demonstrate specifically. But uh, as I told you, manifest file is where you see a lot of this information declared. You will see this kind of a manifest file tomorrow in the example that you will see, that you will see in the lab. This is actually from that example. Okay? Uh, you will see a slightly different uh, name. That should not be 355. I'll be 4521 tomorrow. And you will see an activity declared here. This is nothing but XML. So if you're familiar with XML, it's very easy to read, right? Even if you're not familiar with XML, it's very easy to read, <laughs> right? You don't really need to know XML. I mean, plain English. <laughs> broken, plain broken English. OK? Sorry? Oh, of course. In English, you don't say back, uh, you know, the dash, right? uh, less than, dash, and greater than, and things like that. But you can understand. It's not that difficult to understand. Okay? Activities are usually declared like this in the manifest file. And inside there, you will declare certain properties of activities. You have something called an intent filter, which I'm going to come back to in one of the later slides. And every activity will have a name. And th this will be the corresponding Java file that will be declared there, and uh, and so on. And then this is what a manifest file looks like. This is the simplest one with one single activity in there. If you have more components, you will be declaring one behind the other, like that. Okay. So that's the first thing that you need to consult when you look at an application. If you're designing an Android application, you will declare the activities there first. Sometimes, you know, uh, right in the middle of your um, uh, you're doing work, somebody runs down to my office and says, my application is not working, and so on. I say, have you declared it in the manifest file? Totally forgot about it. Pay attention to the manifest file. If you did not declare it there, Android, runtime doesn't know about it. You might have created the Java file, you might have created the layout, you might have created everything, but if you forgot to include the activity description there properly with the correct name, 
Android doesn't recognize that. So always, this is one of the primary sources of headaches that can occur. Keep in mind that you need to inform the Android framework that these activities exist in your application. Okay? And typically, one of them is declared as the main, uh, as I told you, one of them is declared as the main activity, and this is how you declare an activity as a main activity. So when the icon of your application is, is touched by the user, that's the activity that will start. Okay? So you have to have at least, you'll have to have exactly one of these in your manifest. If that doesn't exist, there is no way to start your application. Okay? And I'll talk more about the intent filter a uh, little bit later. Service. What is a service? As I said, a service runs in the background, sometimes for an indefinite period of time, <coughs> if required, for doing things like playing music, downloading from the on the network and so on. Services do not have user interfaces. They do not have user interfaces. A service is always triggered by an activity and it is in the background. And the only way a service can communicate back is through notifications and so on. Okay? And the service basically extends what is called the service based class. An activity will extend the activity-based class in, and, in, uh, in uh, Android. Activity is the base class uh, for, for Android. I'm sure you know what classes are from your earlier uh, OO courses. We can bind to a running service again. These terms may not make much sense to you at this moment, but they will start making sense when we when you come to come to them later. When you have a service running in the background, if you want to be able to offload some work to it, you should bind to that and say, here, let me establish a connection to you, and then I'll hand over the work to you, and then I will unbind myself from it. And you finish your work, and then come back and tell me. So that's how you, uh, you do this work. Third one, broadcast receivers. Professor? Yeah? Are services unique? Is there only one service that no, is no. done? You can have as many services as you want. Each service doing different kind of work. So, there is, I mean, even within a single application, you could have four or five services. And they may not be running all the time. You may explicitly start a service. Or sometimes, when you start an application, you can have a background service automatically start and so on. I will, I will talk a little bit about that later. But uh, you could create multiple services if required. Each one of them doing different things. Absolutely. So that's that's a very good question. Yeah, something to keep in mind. Okay? Third part. Broadcast receivers. As the name implies, this is something that is receiving a broadcast from someone. How does a service know whom to inform? That is done by using broadcast. Using something called intents. I'm going to talk about intents in, in, in uh, more detail later. Many times the underlying Android framework wants to inform an application of something. And that is where broadcast receivers are very useful. For example, an announcement that a picture is taken. Suppose you start a camera application. You design your own camera application. And then you click on the camera button that you included in your application. What happens? You need to ask the underlying hardware to perform the capture of the picture from the camera hardware device. That you cannot do directly yourself. You need to send a request down to the OS for doing it. So when the OS is finished capturing the screen, it has to no notify back to you saying screen capture, uh, capture of the, uh, of the uh, picture is done. That is done by using a broadcast receiver and so on. Applications can also initiate broadcast to other applications. For example, a service in the background notifying an activity saying something is finished in the back, uh, finished and so on. So whenever you want to listen to something, you start up a broadcast receiver and then wait for somebody to trigger. Or you declare a broadcast receiver and then you will say, if this event occurs, 
trigger my broadcast receiver and it will be stopped. Broadcast receivers also do not have a user interface. The only way they interact is uh, uh, through uh, sending notifications to activities and so on. And uh, also sending notifications to, to the notification bar as we will see in, in some examples. Like Content providers, as I told you, primarily concerned <coughs> with providing access to data. An application may be storing data that, may, that, that it may be willing to provide for your application that can be done by using content. Okay. So, um, again, we'll go into more details about content providers in one of the later chapters when I talk about databases and so on. So, you will see a few things put here. It may not make much sense to you at this moment. But we'll come back to look at what a content resolver object is, what are the methods of content resolver object, what does the content provider base class provide for you, and so on. We'll come back to that in more detail. For sake of completeness, I have put this in here. Okay? <coughs>